Welcome to our series on monitoring hormone therapy where we're going to try to help you navigate the sometimes difficult question of which test is best, a blood test, a saliva test, a urine test, or possibly none of the above given a particular scenario, a particular hormone and a particular route of administration. So how do we know what type of test to use for a different HRT situation? And this time we're talking about sublingual hormones. So those are hormones that are placed under the tongue uh, or possibly could be talking about a transbuccal administration where the hormone would be placed between the cheek and the gum. Uh, but we're looking for absorption, in this case, in the mouth. It's not intended to be swallowed. And what we'll find with this situation is lab testing is not particularly helpful in terms of adjusting the dosage of hormone. So first let's look at serum, blood testing. When you're taking sublingual hormones, the idea of testing blood levels makes a lot of sense, but what happens is the kinetics, the up and down motion of the hormone levels is so fast that it's very difficult to measure. So you can see in this particular situation, the maximum hormone levels at different dosages of testosterone in these women is increased with increasing dosage. But as you test at, as we can see out here, at three hours, there's really no difference at all between the three dosages. And even at two hours or an hour and a half, you can see that the distinction is very, very slight. And so that's going to make it very difficult. So if we contrast this with a different situation, so here's a situation where we have hormone deficient people here, and then they're given DHEA, and we're monitoring testosterone levels here. And you can see that the testosterone levels with supplementation of oral DHEA are very flat, very easy to measure. So if we transpose the sublingual hormone data on top of that, you can see what a different situation it is in that if you're trying to measure in the first couple hours, you're really shooting at a moving target that's going to be changing by a factor of two, three, four over just the course of a, of a few minutes. And if you test out at five, six, eight hours, somewhere in there, you can see that it's already returned to baseline. So that's really not helpful, and it's more likely to be misleading than to actually aid you in making clinical decisions. So that's really not going to work very well. So what about saliva testing with sublingual hormones? Here we've got ourselves a big problem. Hormones are in milligrams in terms of what we're putting in our mouth typically. And in saliva, the hormone coming out, having been in systemic circulation, is in picograms. There are 1 billion picograms in a milligram. So just to give you a little bit of context, from one end of a football field to another, if that's one unit, one picogram, one milligram being a billion times further would be the distance from one end of the football field clear to the sun. So we're talking about orders of magnitude enormous orders of magnitude difference in terms of those concentrations. And so as the hormone levels in blood go up and down very quickly, the levels in saliva are going to reach astronomical levels and then come down. Yes, they'll come down rather quickly, but by the time the contamination is gone, uh, you have no hormone left to measure. So the contamination of the mouth last longer than the increased levels in circulation. So for me personally, my levels typically start, unfortunately, a little bit less than 100. Um, and when I'm taking a sublingual hormone, say tes this isn't testosterone in this case, my levels max out at a little over 100 million picograms per milliliter. And so for that level to come all the way down and disappear to where you're actually testing the levels of testosterone I'm actually exposed to systemically, it just just doesn't work. The results are really of no value. You're either going to be measuring a contamination or a baseline level depending on when you test, but it really doesn't help you monitor the therapy. So, and in some cases people will say, well, if you wait 30 hours, the contamination is gone. That's true. But again, then you're just left measuring a baseline level, which really is an additive to the clinical picture. So with urine hormones, the hormones get into circulation and urine gets its fair share. So every bit of this hormone that gets in is going to get then conjugated. And so the urine levels are going to lag behind just a little bit, but you can capture all that urine and you can measure that. So this should work. But it doesn't if you swallow it. And that's really the trick with testing using urine testing and why it really isn't effective as well in terms of monitoring dosage is it, it only works if none is swallowed. So swallowed hormones, oral hormones, create about 10 times more hormone in the urine than a true sublingual dose from first pass effects. So this hormone is going to go in, get metabolized, end up in urine, having never been in circulation 
as a free hormone. That's really more along the lines of a false positive. And so those values really aren't that meaningful. And it's very difficult to keep patients from swallowing the hormone when they take it. So there really isn't a good solution for dosing in terms of increasing or decreasing dosages when you're talking about sublingual hormones. There's really not a solution. So urine testing can be additive in terms of looking at metabolism. You know, how is my estrogen being metabolized in terms of metabolites that are more cancer-friendly as opposed to those that are more carcinogenic. Uh, with progesterone, you can glean a little bit of information, but it's really not that helpful uh, in terms of adjusting dosage. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us at info at precisionhormones.com uh, if you have anything to add to the conversation or if you'd like information on our testing.